another day, another story. After Charles I of Spain signed an edict launching the transatlantic slave trade, human cargo on transatlantic voyages spiked nearly tenfold. In August 1518, King Charles I authorized Spain to ship enslaved people directly from Africa to the Americas. The edict marked a new phase in the transatlantic slave trade in which the numbers of enslaved people brought directly to the Americas, without going through a European port first, rose dramatically. Researchers have uncovered new details about those first direct voyages. Welcome to Tabo Eminent Channel. Historians David Wheat and Mark Eagle have identified about 18 direct voyages from Africa to the Americas in the first several years after Charles I authorized these trips, the earliest such voyages we know about. King Charles I Slavery The transatlantic slave trade didn't start in 1518, but it did increase after King Charles authorized direct Africa to Caribbean trips that year. In the 1510s and 20s, ships sailing from Spain to the Caribbean settlements of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola might contain as few as one or two enslaved people, or as many as 30 or 40. By the mid-1520s, we're seeing 200, sometimes as many as almost 300, captives being brought on the same slave ship, from Africa, says Wheat, a history professor at Michigan State University. It's difficult to trace what parts of Africa the captives on board came from, since many were captured on the mainland and shipped to island ports off the coast before Spanish boats took them to the Americas. This is also some of our earliest examples of enslaved people throwing themselves overboard, people dying of malnutrition, wheat ads. Some of the same really horrible and violent and brutal aspects of the slave trade that was seen much later on, we're seeing them already in these voyages from Sao Tome in the 1520s. Sao Tome was a colonial island port off the west coast of Africa that Portugal established in the mid-1400s. Before 1518, Portugal forced enslaved Africans to work on islands in the eastern Atlantic. In addition, Spanish ships brought captive Africans to the Iberian Peninsula, from which they sent them to the Caribbean. Slave Ship Spain may have increased the number of enslaved Africans it brought to the Caribbean after 1518 because the native people it had previously enslaved there were dying from European disease and colonial violence. Though it's not clear how many captive Africans arrived through the 1520s, Wheat estimates the number is in the thousands. We don't have many first-hand accounts of Africans in the Americas during this period, but one exception is Rodrigo Lopez, a former enslaved man in Africa's Cape Verde Islands freed in a slaveholder's will. After he became a free man, he was captured and sent to the Americas, where he was re-enslaved in the late 1520s. Lopez, who could read and write Latin, protested his re-enslavement and won back his freedom in the early 30s. It's an unusual case because we have not only a person who was of very high status among enslaved people in the Cape Verde Islands, Wheat says, but also because, he sues for his freedom and he writes about it, and that document still survives. Lopez explained that one of his master's former employees kidnapped him in the night and sold him into slavery. This was illegal, Lopez argued, because he was free man now. Most of the enslaved men, women and children in the Caribbean didn't have the option of suing for their freedom. Still, there were some free people of color in Spanish American colonies, because race wasn't yet as closely tied to slave status as it would be during American chattel slavery. It was considered normal for enslaved people to be black, even though there were enslaved people of other origins, Wheat says. But at the same time, it was also normal for there to be small numbers of free people of color in Iberian societies around the Atlantic. Caribbean Plantation Wheat and Eagle will publish an essay on their research in a forthcoming book, From the Galleons to the Highlands, Slave Trade Routes in the Spanish Americas in 2019. For the project, they spent a lot of time studying Spanish shipping records and lawsuits from the Caribbean that mentioned slave voyages. Most of the lawsuits involve either one of two things, corruption or disgruntled investors, Wheat says. Corruption often involved officials who had permitted unlicensed slave trading voyages to take place. Crown officials pursued these types of corruption lawsuits, whereas investors usually sued after losing money on a slave voyage. Dealing with the casual brutality in these records is often difficult, says Eagle, a history professor at Western Kentucky University. 
Even in a report about a slave revolt, the whole report is about a captain who's trying to justify the fact that he's lost some goods to his investors, and it really is just like he's talking about merchandise, he observes. When a slave dies they'll send somebody to record what the brand was on the slave and what they died of and keep a record, and that's all again for commercial purposes. They can claim that as loss later on, Eagle continues. So it is really kind of horrifying to read things like this and realize they're talking about human beings. Recent research has uncovered the grim details of some of the earliest transatlantic slave voyages, shedding light on the brutality of these expeditions and their catastrophic impact on both Africa and the Americas. The transatlantic slave trade officially began in 1518 when King Charles I of Spain authorized the direct shipment of enslaved Africans to the Americas. This marked a significant shift, increasing the number of enslaved people transported directly from Africa to the Caribbean. Early voyages, from 1518 to 1530, were primarily organized by Spanish and Portuguese merchants who obtained charters and licenses from the Spanish Crown, IBW 21st Century, The Independent, History of Black Travel. The first documented voyages included ships from the Cape Verde Islands to the Caribbean, carrying captives from regions like Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. These voyages were organized by prominent figures like Laurent de Gouverneau, who subcontracted the transport to various merchants and ship captains, IBW 21st century. These initial voyages were marked by severe hardships. For example, voyages from Sao Tome to Puerto Rico carried significant numbers of enslaved individuals under harrowing conditions. Some records indicate voyages with as many as 257 slaves, highlighting the scale and cruelty of these early expeditions, the independent. The consequences of this trade were devastating. In Africa, the demand for slaves led to increased warfare and raiding, destabilizing entire regions. Meanwhile, in the Caribbean, the need for enslaved labor arose due to the massive depopulation of indigenous peoples, primarily caused by diseases, warfare, and harsh colonial practices, IBW 21st century, the independent. Furthermore, archaeological discoveries have revealed the tragic fate of many enslaved Africans who perished during shipwrecks. Recent findings by the Bahamas Lost Ships Project uncovered 14 sunken slave ships, emphasizing the perilous journeys and high mortality rates among the enslaved, Archaeology News Online magazine. These discoveries underscore the profound human suffering and historical impact of the early transatlantic slave trade, reminding us of the deep scars it left on both continents. The archaeological and historical evidence from these early voyages underscores the brutality and scale of the transatlantic slave trade. It highlights the immense human suffering and long-lasting impacts on African and American societies. The discoveries continue to shed light on this dark chapter of history, emphasizing the importance of remembering and acknowledging the atrocities committed during this period, Archaeology News Online magazine. Thanks for watching request you to subscribe the channel.